Hey, thanks so much, Rebecca. Gosh, uh, where do you go from there? Look, this graph, I think, shows a bit of it all, a graph or chart. There could be a bit of a religious debate. Um, but my name is Mike, uh, sometimes called Michael, but Mike goes well. Uh, I am the VP of Engineering at Octopus. I've been there for about six-ish years. I keep forgetting how long. Uh, somewhere around 2015, I joined where the bar chart was well, the bar was small uh, and it's grown around me and I've learned a lot uh, since I've been there. So I'm very thankful. Uh, but in the last year, you can see this is our entire, uh, entire company headcount. Um, in the last year, we've pretty much doubled, uh, which is just a bit crazy. And we'll talk a bit about that. So, yep. Hi, I'm Mike. Uh, look, I am an expert. Hmm, think for a moment here. Look, I'm an expert in my problems, and that's what I'm really going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about my problems. That should be fun. Uh, we're really going to focus on uh, some of the lessons that we learned, and I'm not going to focus on the things that are obvious. I'm going to try my best to think about the things that we were surprised by on the way through. So if some of this isn't applicable to you, uh, I do apologize, but I really hope that you get something from it. So a bit of an introduction, uh, a little bit of um, Shakespeare on the way through. Uh, a little bit of Mythbusters, we're going with a bit of a theme here, and then um, I'll end up with a summary and a reading list for you because 45 minutes plus Q&A is nowhere going to be enough uh, to learn some of the lessons that we learned on the way through. So like I said before, I really hope this talk will be helpful to you if you're a leader in an R&D team, uh, specifically maybe a product team like Octopus is. If your company is anywhere between 10 and 100 people, I suggest that as you start to get you know, outside those Dunbar's numbers uh, up high, things change again, maybe not as significantly as what I'm concerned about. Uh, below 10, some of the things we're going to talk about maybe are overkill. Uh, and the other thing is that if you are looking to scale up, I hope that this is really practical and, and uh, some of the questions come out later. But if you don't, there's still going to be something in here for you. So some spoilers, uh, start with the end in mind. Look, um, I'm going to harp on this a little bit. Choose your culture. Okay. Um, then the next thing is explain and demonstrate what good looks like. Culture, behaviors, all that kind of thing. Uh, and then just like good agile software development, when it comes to doing this kind of work, it was very iterative. Start somewhere, learn uh, and iterate quickly. So to Shakespeare, to scale or not to scale? Look, when we set out on asking ourselves the question, should we even, uh, we were really happy with the size of the company we were at. We were building a lifestyle company. Uh, it's just that it kind of got out of control. Uh, like any scale up, if you've been through a scale up before, uh, some people liken it to riding a tiger. You just hold on for dear life and hope you don't fall off and maybe get eaten. Uh, so our goal was to hire and retain more amazing people because we had some pretty amazing people there already uh, so that we could help more customers and in turn make our business more valuable. Um, look, some people talk about, and, and let's be honest, it is about making money, it's about making a really valuable company. Um, but I can also be honest and truth be told that we really do believe that um, yeah, a more valuable company comes as a happy byproduct of more happy customers. And that's really where our focus is. So there's the goal that we set out with uh, when we were asking ourselves, is it worth scaling up? Um, and so we we didn't go through it in this structure. I, I took time to figure out something that might help you. Uh, we took a much more meandering approach and landed on a spot where it was just so obvious that we needed to scale up um, that we did it. So if I had my time over again, hopefully you get this chance, is maybe use a, a bit of a matrix like this to help you figure out what might drive you towards scaling, what might actually detract from it and nudge you away from it. Uh, but what I will focus on is, is these actions uh, that I'm suggesting. So starting with the team, you know, do the team want to grow or not? Uh, it's kind of like, like lead a horse to water and you can't make them drink. If your team is crying out for it to grow, there's probably something underneath that that is driving it. Or there might be resistance and you could dig into why best thing ask the team ask them honestly um, try to get to the bottom of what their um, their sentiment is uh, beyond that TAM so total addressable market uh, is it large and growing or is it small and shrinking uh, sometimes this is out of your control if you if you're you know your product I guess is fairly fixed um, but if you can pivot or you can change your offering you might be able to address uh, so change the total addressable market um, do you have the dollars you need? Because this does cost a bit of money. You've got to have a bit of a war chest there. Or do you not have it? Um, that's going to be a pretty you know, big impediment. Uh, so then you've got options like looking for investment or do you have cash at hand? Um, uh, thankfully, we ended up with both. Uh, do you have deep experience leadership or is it shallow? Right. And this is really going to speak to how well you can iterate and learn. Um, and controller growth. Uh, control is probably the wrong word. I guess, again, riding the tiger to be able to, um, uh, what do you say? grow with the growth. 
So if you're going to grow leadership internally, that takes time. Like it takes a lot of time. I've been uh, working in leadership roles for gosh, 20 something years. And I still don't think I'm an expert. Um, growing leadership takes a lot of time. What do you hire external experience in? And that comes with risk, right? Is it going to be a good cultural ad or alignment uh, and those kind of things? Uh, productivity, like will it scale? You know, you don't go to infinite scale. Will it scale somewhat linearly as you add more people that they can do more stuff or will it not? Uh, this is something that hurt us a little bit and is hurting us a little bit and probably hurts a lot of scale ups. Um, so, yeah, you've got options there with a new control around your architecture, you build delivery pipelines, um, you know, DevOps uh, research and things there. And last thing I'll mention, do you have a strong foundation of people and culture or is it not? And again, similar to the leadership. So digging in, this is where we were. So if I had this in front of me and I used this tool, it would have been pretty obvious that um, you know we should grow up, uh, scale up. But the yellow things, uh, I'm not going to focus on this today, but this is something that is a, a much bigger topic to dig into and plenty of reading around about that. Uh, but I will say that they, we are wrestling with this. And a lot of the companies I talk to where they also come from a monolithic background, they're wrestling with this for not months, for years, and probably still wrestling with it. So don't have an end of the story for that one yet. All right, so our story. We had a very efficient team but we were leaving a lot of opportunity on the floor. Uh, we had the growth, the ARR growth we needed. Our total addressable market is kind of every software development company in the world, uh, and that's growing, uh, as we can see with supply and demand. Uh, the We were very experienced and leadership heavy, very strong in that area to our benefit and our detriment, but I'm going to say generally for our benefit. Um, we had a very strong foundation of people and culture, but we had understaffed that function at, at, at Octopus. Um, and yeah, the snail there, our monolithic architecture and deployment, which really spoke to, we're going to have some challenges around productivity. We did it. Okay. But what's your story? So maybe you can use that little hints in the matrix there. Maybe it's really clear already that you shouldn't be, you should be, you need to be. It's, you know, it's the usual thing. I think we left it to the latest responsible moment, somewhere between when it is too late and when it feels like it's too late. That's around about where our story started. All right. So are we ready to scale? Uh, what I'm going to say here is that um, with this piece of the conversation, focus on what you can control. I talked about total addressable market before. That's really hard to control, but there are things that you can and should, and I'm going to talk about two of those that I think are really important to consider uh, within your realm of control and to do before you scale up. The first one is your culture. This is like set your North Star, figure out what North actually looks like before you start adding the fuel. Right. Um, so not only choose it, but write it down. So start with Stephen Covey's you know, habits around live by design, not by default, but then write it down, put a stake in the ground, write it down to clarify, write it down to argue about it. And so we did. We actually went public with our handbook. And this is one of the best things I think we've done in oh, years is we took all of the things that we'd learned about building a company like Octopus and building a company we wanted to work at um, that we'd actually written down in places and just brought it all together, you know, polished it off a bit and put it in public. Uh, it turns out this is really good for employer branding as well. So when you're trying to hire a lot of people, um, the best thing about this is it's out there and we're being upfront and people that want to work with us read it and say, I want that or I really don't want that. And it's a nice self-selection tool. But on top of that, it acts as our, I said North Star before, a stake in the ground. We go back to this. We point to it all the time. We have mechanisms that point people back to this to remind them about why we exist and why we're here and what really matters to us. Um, and so I think that's really important because um, you're about to explode in growth and uh, you've got one, one or two chances, I would suggest, when you're growing a company to choose what your culture is going to be for the rest of the life of the, the company. Uh, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is around building and retaining experienced leaders. If you don't have really strong leaders, you've got to find a way to get them before you scale up because it's going to be, like I said, riding the tiger. The, the experienced leadership is going to be your ability to hold on to the reins okay, and to steer the ship as it goes. Uh, so I actually, I'm going to do a little self-promotion. This isn't self-promotion. It's really just trying to help everybody that I've done talks on this previously. And this is one of them uh, at CTO Summit in 2019. That digs into building uh, for world-class engineering. And a lot of it is about building and retaining a world-class engineering team. So going to recommend that talk to you. Who is that handsome guy? All right. So are we ready to scale up? Here's some questions for you. Have you chosen your culture? If you haven't, I suggest 
take a month and do it. Have we written it down? Um, take a week and do it. Take, a, take two months and just take the time it needs to do that. Uh, will the new people we hire actually thrive? Are they set up to win? And can we iterate quickly as we learn? Uh, not in a haphazard, crazy way, but can we see a problem, address the problem, ratchet up and not regress? Okie dokie. Oh, little insertion here, Mythbusters. Uh, I thought I'd have a bit of sort of fun with this, but um, these are some things that I thought and were commonly thought would be problems for us. So I'd like to challenge some of those. So maybe I should have called it myth challenges. I don't know, because I don't think I've done a scientific approach here. I have a sample size of maybe one or two. So you can't increase diversity when scaling up. I've heard this argument before, uh, similar to my next point as well, that when you're trying to aggressively scale, you reduce your, um, your space for making choices. Uh, and in reality, um, what uh, I'm suggesting here based on our experience is this is the best time to do it because you are so focused on hiring and onboarding and those opportunities to get a great culture together and get it out there. So we found that we've actually had a better time increasing uh, diversity at Octopus while we've been in this scale up. Um, and not only have we done that in a fairly common way by introducing junior engineers in across a different, more diverse um, background. Uh, we've been able to do that across the entire scope of Octopus leadership and uh, we're really proud of that. So I thought this was interesting. I saw this uh, tweet today from Mark over at Culture Amp and I, I thought this was awesome. And he's gone in and said, so sample size of two now, uh, he's gone in and said, look, we actually had a really good time scaling up and digging into some of these things around diversity. And there's some really good insights in that thread if you go read it. Um, cool. Another myth that I'd like to challenge. Um, you need to lower the bar to scale up. And this was a big concern for us. I mentioned before that we were experience and leadership heavy. Uh, what we found was that um, uh, there was concerns amongst the team that, again, our problem, uh, sorry, our decision uh, power or whatever would reduce through the demand of needing to scale up. Um, again, what we did is because we'd written down our culture, we'd written down our standards, uh, we actually found that they became even clearer as we had a larger sample size of people to draw from that we were interviewing and hiring. Uh, and so what we've done is we, I'm proud to say that we haven't lowered the bar in order to scale up. Um, all of the reasons for that, it's a pretty complex system, uh, but I'd like to say that if this is something you're worried about, my experience in a sample size of one is you don't have to. All right, you can't scale up without becoming siloed, hierarchical and slow. This was another big concern because we were a small team and there was a lot of consensus building and people knew what was going on. Look, we have introduced a level of hierarchy at a director level, um, uh, so just, just below me and in between our managers. Um, and what we've found is that, yes, that does mean there is one more hop in certain communication paths, but we've deliberately organized ourselves in a way that teams are more autonomous, more empowered, um, that as small units that work well together. And we are going now faster than we've ever gone before. So again, sample size of one, uh, busting that myth. Last thing, you can't maintain or improve your culture when scaling up. Um, I think this is fundamentally what I talked about before, because we had taken the time to define it, choose it, write it down, is that as we've added people, they've self-selected into our culture and then they've added to it. Because what we've found is that they're, they're reading what we've written or adding to what we've written, um, sorry, bringing their own perspective and adding to it. Um, and so we've really enjoyed this. And I'd, I'd like to suggest in my experience and my observation is that our culture is better today because of all of the people um, that we've added. There you go. So a few myths challenged or busted. Okay, let's move into the meat. So this is where we get into the lessons that I learned on the way through. So like any good software project, start somewhere, learn quickly and iterate deliberately. Okay, this is there's just that deliberate word I think is important. We'll get to that soon. Um, but I just want to put you in the headspace of where we were at at the time when we started is that growing our engineering team to 95 was our target. So let's say 100. Uh, and when I say engineering, I, I should say R&D. We just uh, an engineering background. It seemed like an insurmountable mountain. I, I had no idea how we were going to get there and make it work. I was just so overwhelmed with the idea of finding and hiring and then let alone retaining that many people. Um, and uh, the funny thing is that that mountain actually wasn't as hard because it's all of this stuff. It's sourcing, interviewing, onboarding, training, coaching, organizing, managing, and sometimes exiting. But 
I, I reflect on my year of learning this stuff and it really felt like it was just good process engineering. I'm, I'm a good engineer. I'm a good process engineer. All of these things are just work to be done, problems to solve, things to learn. And there is a certain amount of art and science to it all. But these are the things that you kind of look at and go, they're the obvious things I need to do. So what I want to do is say, I'm going to spend no time on them and point to some good books. But what I will do is spend more time on some of the lessons we learned, surprise we had. I mentioned before, this is the first one, that we had underfunded people and culture. I'll say that in inverted commas there around the team. Um, so we invested in it um, primarily Paul, uh, our founder and myself, we'd poured a lot of time and effort into this and getting that together. Um, but we didn't, I think we underestimated the, the sheer amount of um, hidden work around the organization in this area. So this is a bit of a takeaway uh, for, for everyone here is consider if you don't have a people and culture team or function like we didn't, then try getting everybody to list out their hidden work, right? The work that they do in this area and then put it all together. And um, we only did this with two people before we realized that it was way more than one or two people could possibly do on their own. We needed to build a team around it. And so that's what we set out to do. So our story, look, we started with that good foundation. I won't labor it anymore. Uh, then we hired a director of people and culture. Um, her name is Batania, and um, she self-selected in like a lot of the applicants because they could, because they could see what we stood for. Um, and we already knew then through the interviews that we'd have good alignment on that. Um, next up was a talent acquisition manager. We'd never had anybody like that before. We just opened the front door and people would sometimes go, oh, I like the idea of working there. We had to get very... Uh, let's say aggressive, a lot more active in the way that we went after and found people and sourced them. So great talent acquisition manager. Um, and we've just hired somebody recently in people operations to take care of all the needful things. I think there's two more hires for the end of this year in that team. So what was done by a lot of people part-time or ignored when, you know, when that wasn't their job to do, uh, now we have a full-time team around. So uh, what we've, what I've observed here is that through, through doing what we did earlier and then fun it like put our money where our mouth is we're building this self-reinforcing um you know people and culture not only function but kind of just i don't know ecosystem within the company all right another lesson another surprise we had avoided a specialization specifically into people management this was a real identity crisis for us as engineering leaders uh, and i talk again this is my background um you know the pendulum and the ladder and uh you know it is people management just a hat you wear or not? And um, this is something that, you know, being transparent, we really struggled with for probably 18 months. Um, and so as I look at it now in retrospect, let's imagine there's four big backpacks full of responsibilities. And if you broke them down into say people management and product management and project management and technical management, just as an example of four, and they're full of all these different jobs you've got to do, you you one person can't wear four backpacks or you just load all the responsibilities in one and it gets really heavy. And I think what we found was that people would take the things they didn't like doing out of the backpack and they picked them up when they caught on fire, right? And so while we thought we were capable of being these all-terrain vehicles that could do anything, um, history over the last six months has shown us that having people that are carrying right-sized backpacks full of responsibilities they're going to pick up on the nuances that were otherwise ignored when they weren't on fire. So this is what we did. We got people to draw up a mind map of the responsibilities, you know, the things they did on a week-to-week -week basis. And over a couple of weeks, they built it up with this full list. And then we asked them to honestly choose what they wanted to keep, what they wanted to drop. And then we set about figuring out how to fill the gaps. Turned out that that shape, um, there's, a, there's a pretty cool blog post, I should link to it, um, called Engineering Manager Archetypes by Pat Kua. And uh, there's five archetypes in there. And we're aiming more for the team lead archetype. And we've found that that is a really good match for us. So now we've got these technical leads with team leads uh, and or engineering managers, and that works really well for us. So what it ended up doing was meaning that we clarified a management track and a software engineering track. Uh, and we spent a, a fair bit of time on that over the last 18 months. We've now hired sp um, specialized engineering managers. Um, we are building our product and design functions because a technical company building a technical product for a technical customer base, we thought we knew it all, but we're finding that there's a lot of value in having specialized product managers and de designers, especially in the area of research. Um, and most of the work now is as we've specialized, we're having to learn how to work together because no longer do you have one person that's got it all in their head. Uh, and so what we found was that we are making higher quality decisions at speed. 
it does feel less efficient because I've got to talk to somebody. I can't just think about it and make a decision. Um, but we feel like that's okay because ultimately we're picking up on things earlier. Problems are getting detected earlier and fixed. All right, another problem. We had unclear ownership because everybody kind of owned everything. And here's this is a bit of a weird picture, but when I started in 2015, that red, the yellow circle-y thing on the left is a mind map of our cognitive load. I just wrote stuff out. That was what I had to learn. It took me about a year to be effective at Octopus uh, across that entire um, ecosystem. And then I did it again in 2020 and it had, well, I don't know how it combines together, but the red circle is much bigger. And there is no way that any of our new starters, let alone the people who've been there for three, four years, could actually do all of that stuff. Uh, and so you know, I don't even know where to start. Should I? St yeah, anyway, we'll move on. But it had just grown way beyond our control. Um, and so uh, what we ended up doing was mapping that down to teams. So there's a bit of work here, right? Because we had to have more teams, which meant we had to have some people, add the people, and then we, yeah. So it's been this continually ongoing process of mapping out responsibilities to teams and then empowering them. And so this is just an example of some of the teams we have today at Octopus and the areas of that ownership they take care of. So our story, um, this has been really useful for us, uh, RACI. I don't know if you've heard of it before, but if you haven't, it's uh, responsible, accountable, consulted and informed. It comes up in product management speak sometimes. Um, we found that this language has been really useful to say you're ultimately accountable or this team's ultimately accountable. They're the owner or the custodian. And then other teams might be responsible for certain parts of it or they just want to be consulted. Um, or merely informed of changes as they go through. So we've adopted that and we've found that's really helped with our mission towards better ownership. We've clarified team ownership and that's used on a daily basis by all teams across Octopus. Pardon me. So our solutions and support teams navigate that map to some, you know, from time to time to figure out who to talk to about certain issues. Um, another thing that I'll call out here, I should have elevated this a bit more, but we've actually, um, is it the right word chosen, anointed, some career track owners. Um, so there are two people in our organization now that are fully accountable for our two primary career tracks in engineering, so software engineering and um, uh, management. Uh, product management, design, there's a few different career tracks and each of them have a clear owner. And what we found was before that everybody cared about how we interview and everybody cared about the whole lot, right? And making decisions was so hard and laborious and I don't think anybody enjoyed it. Um, and so what we did was did, there's somebody that's accountable, there's a small group of responsible people and they're the ones who are taking uh, yeah, responsibility to learn and get the data and make do those experiments throughout our pipeline. And hopefully we'll get to sell a story like the um, Culture Amp team about the experiments we've done over this year. Uh, the last thing we did recently is, an, is again, anoint a technical leadership group. We've got uh, a bunch of principal software engineers amongst our team of around about 78 people today, uh, 95 at the end of the year, and we see them as bar raisers. They are not ivory tower architects, okay? They work within teams and they, they, they share out, again, ownership or accountability for certain parts, but their job is to own our mission, uh, sorry, our, our technical vision, a technical strategy, and then raise the bar of architectural decisions being made by teams. So that's just a few ideas, like practical things we did there uh, that are helping us make, again, higher quality decisions at speed. Zipping on quickly, uh, managing headcount was a new concept. Like headcount, what kind of currency is that? Is it like US dollars or Australian dollars? I don't know, but I never cared about this before. This is my first time being a manager. Um, and it turns out that in management world, headcount's this thing that everybody knows about. Well, apparently everybody knows about. And this is probably the area where I was just the most naive and I learned the most. So you can laugh at me or laugh with me or cry on my shoulder, whichever one works for you. Um, but you know what happens here? When will I get the people we need? You know, because we just split our teams up and you know spread out to cover our ecosystem and there's two people working on a team because teams are one and no fun, but where do I get the people? When do I get them? Am I, is my team a priority? What have I got to do? Have I got to do a dance or a sing or I got to pay you money, right? How can I ask for more people? Uh, what's the process? Or how do we manage transfers? If somebody leaves my team and goes, do I, do I get the people back? Um, so we didn't find any turnkey solutions for this. We just had to learn on, you know, just in time. We built tools on the fly. We built processes on the fly because I went searching and there was nothing that said, oh, by the way, you're probably going to have a headcount problem. Here's the tool you need to buy and here's a subscription, right, to go and manage all this for you. I think because it's very people-centric and it's very context, uh, you know, sensitive. 
Um, so we have built tooling. I'll show you a little bit of that in a sec. Um, but what I think, <laughs> what I see today and what I think will live with us forever is this tension between demand and supply. Uh, I don't think that will get resolved while you're growing. See, if you're not growing, if your system is stable, like if your company is stable, there probably won't be a tension between supply and demand as much as if you're trying to double your team in a year, there will be a huge tension between supply and demand. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's probably some sort of mathematical function we could define. We're not going to, but I did draw a chart. And so the tool, uh, the tip I'm going to give you is take planning and allocation and progress and your process and all that stuff and make it as transparent as you can. Because uh, in engineering teams, we've got some pretty clever people working with us uh, and they, we've found, given the right information, given the right context, uh, they will land on congruent decisions, right? They'll understand it better. So we've got some tools we built up and, you know, I'm, I'm a programmer, so I programmed a spreadsheet. I'm a programmer who became a manager. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and now I program spreadsheets. I remember talking to somebody, a senior engineering manager at another company, and they said, Mike, get ready because very soon you will be driving pie charts. And I thought, no, but I know everybody at the company. And they just said, no, no, they're doing this action. You'll be driving pie charts. And I'm like, yeah, couldn't be more true. Um, so here's my spreadsheet. It's got about five or six sheets all combined together and we're having trouble with sources of truth and stuff. But this, this chart of growth that you can see on the screen there gives me a way to predict velocity, which gives me a way to talk to my managers about when they might get the people they need. And then the other one is a way that we've designed our priorities. Okay, so we've got an allocation plan um, that, that works okay. Not perfect, but okay, there's tension in it that allows teams to see where they sit in the priority list as of today. And that's according to a whole bunch of factors. Alrighty, so we're still working on this. Uh, I don't have a perfect answer, but here's a tip. Headcount seems to be a pretty good constraint, right? You're not gonna add a hundred people overnight, um, but you can think about your velocity and then you can make predictions based on it. It's a pretty good currency. It's, it's what our managers talk about a lot now. Um, it's actually an interesting currency where you say, look, I really have a thing I'd like to get done. Um, and it seems like we're gonna collaborate on this. Let's get some headcount together and we'll, yeah, and we'll share it out. Uh, and it's a pretty good contract between teams. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm liking headcount. I think it's okay. Uh, and I'm learning how to work with it. All right. The last thing I'll show with you is things were changing so quickly. <laughs> this is the riding the tiger thing, right? So the lesson we learned from this is choose a cadence for communication and change. Um, I'm going to rush through it a bit because I want to get to Q&A. So our story, we had a weekly cadence for communication and then we lost it. Don't quite know why, don't quite know when, don't quite know how, but we did. And what was happening is that then when change was ready to occur, as in we knew what we wanted to do, we kind of drop it, do it, uh, drop the change and do it. Um, but what we found was that that was hard for teams to know about, right? They couldn't predict it. And so now what we've done is we said, there is one opportunity in a week where teams are asked to all come together, um, this is in R&D, and listen, right? Otherwise, go back to the hard problems you're trying to solve for customers. But then, yeah, come back here and let's think about what we're doing internally. We have an eight-weekly cadence for medium change. And the way I describe that to myself is we're not talking about a full reorg. It's really every eight weeks, we want teams to think about their mission, clarify what they're doing. Um, if, they're, if their mission's too big and they're thinking about a split, the time to do it is in that eight-weekly cadence. And then we have breathing room to handle the exception cases. So what we've found is that now change is more normal than expected uh, by people. It's more predictable, meaning that people know when it's going to happen a little bit more and it's more manageable as in we know those inflection points and it's kind of like there's the old way, there's the new way and our teams know how to map between the two and when it's going to happen. Ooh. I hope I've done all right with time. I forgot to start my timer. Um, but in summary, in summary, there was all that list of stuff um, but again, I want to reinforce again, choose your culture. Don't let it be chosen for you. Take the time to explain and demonstrate what good actually looks like and never stop because I, I find myself every week saying, what have, I need to stop and write down what good looks like. Um, and then ride the tiger, start, learn and iterate. Here's a whole bunch of stuff we didn't talk about. <laughs> you might've seen some of these words before. These are all things we're dealing with at the moment as well. Um, and so you can read those, uh, but what I will do is say, we didn't touch them and you need to. Um, so over to a reading list. Look, I'll leave you with this. Here's uh, eight books. 
<laughs> that's a lot of reading. Um, I'm learning quickly. And so over the last three years, I've read these books and others, but these are the ones that have had the most influence on our culture at Octopus within R&D uh, and the way that we think about what we're doing right now as we ride the tiger of scaling Octopus. Take a breath, Mike, and there we go, ready for Q&A. I hope that's helped somebody. Well, Mike, thanks a lot. And um, yes, you had you still got plenty of time. So okay. everybody <laughs> rush over to the Q&A tab and ask all your questions because Mike has kindly left extra time in the Q&A to be peppered with questions oh. to which he will make up answers, right? Is that how Mike has landed that way, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, it. Uh, all right. Yeah. So first question in the Q&A is uh, from Reese, and he wants to know how did you measure success in people and culture? Success in people and culture. Hmm. <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, I guess people and culture, I'm trying to think of a great way to answer it. I talked about uh, the goal with scaling up. If you've got a bad culture and you're growing, you're scaling up, you'll probably have higher attrition right people coming and then leaving uh, we've found that our attrition is insanely low like really really low so that's a number that we look at around if we've got a place where people love working and they're doing the best work of their lives then we'll we'll be you know retaining great people um, so that's i guess if you wanted to boil it down to one thing that i can think of on the fly um, uh, showing that yeah attrition regrettable attrition maybe is a good way to say it as well um, I'm just trying to think of something else. Uh, another thing would probably be, are you achieving what you really want to? You know, are you proud of it? I, and this is subjective, um, but I know that Paul uh, and, and I, we wanted to build a company we love working at, right? And I think there's that kind of pub test around, do you love working here? And do I still love working here? And yeah, so if I was to say a metric, yeah, think about regrettable attrition. Uh, the pub test, look, that's, do I love working here still? The pub test, so Aussie for, uh, <laughs> for for those of you uh, watching not from Australia. Uh, oh, true, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> do you want to do you want to brief, briefly explain what's the pub test? Oh, uh, look, my understanding of the pub test is if you're you're at the pub and you know you go around and you want to find out something. So, um, does it relate to the normal working class human? Right, you go to the pub and you ask them, and they'll tell you what they think. Probably half a pint deep. There you go. So, so insert your own cultural location where people hang out here. <laughs> All right. Next question from Daniel. What was your infrastructure before and after scaling? If they were different, how was that transition managed? Oh, infrastructure. Okay. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Um, I'll try and answer that. And maybe Daniel can somehow get through to us if he wants something more specific. Um, we, for years, we'd worked remote first, right? So that drives a certain amount of decisions. Um, so as far as that infrastructure goes, it was all you know, public cloud and publicly accessible things from your home. Uh, so as far as you know, where we keep code and how we work together. So as far as infrastructure to help us get our work done, that hasn't changed. It's actually, I guess, just gotten more reinforced. When it comes to, I guess, hosting our you know, SaaS platform, has that changed as we scale up? Um, yes, because we're evolving that platform all the time. Uh, no, uh, not significantly due to the scale up. I'm trying to think what else might be there. Oh, infrastructure. Let me think about build and release, right? We've had to double uh, so we didn't we didn't really think too much about efficiency so that's something interesting that i've learned a bit more about is we were able to absorb certain costs and and where how do you decide how does a team decide i should invent uh, investing cost savings or moving our mission forward like uh, what's the tipping point for them and um, we're still working on some rules of thumb to help us there. Uh, but what we found was that as we like doubled our headcount, uh, doubled the number of engineers that are committing code, uh, we've doubled the costs of running all of that stuff on our cloud infrastructure for builds and things. Uh, and so we've actually got it back down to where it was before through efficiencies. Um, but that seems to be like it's going to be an ongoing fight. Mm. Next question is from Richard, and he says, can you give examples of what you wrote down in your statements of culture for the early foundation? Right. Oh, gosh, it is so much stuff. Um, 
we wrote down our top five values as a company. So, you know, customer obsession is, is the first one, listening to our customers over watching what competitors do and trying to copy them, right? So we wrote down those company values. We wrote down um, where I talked about career. We've got a, a public GitHub website. Um, that is our statement about all of our roles and the leveling and the career tracks and, and what that means. And it's very public and, and very um, objective as much as we can make it. Uh, what else did we write down? And gosh, it was all the way through to, I, I didn't talk about equity in depth, but if we talk about diversity, equity and inclusion, we really focused our cultural things around equity and inclusion, right? That would make a place where diversity is welcome. And so our, the way we pay, the way we do performance management, the way we do feedback, uh, we, we worked really hard on making that equitable. Um, and so we've got a thing we call a printer test that we run when we're doing salary reviews. And it's just that if you're doing the same job as somebody else, you will be paid the same amount of money as them um, based on local market. So it was it was sort of a bit of everything. Um, but if you want to dig in deeper, start at our handbook, so handbook.octopus.com, and then roll through from there and everything's accessible. And hopefully that'll give you a better example of what's in there. Nice. Next question is from Patrick. In an operations critical environment, how do you drive innovation in R&D, given that the environment is results driven and R&D doesn't necessarily mean there will be a positive output? Hmm. I'm trying to connect all the dots there. Can you read it out again? Or push <laughs> on it? I, 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 my, my summary is... Um, yeah. No, I'll read it again. In an, in an operations critical environment, how do you yep. drive innovation in R&D, given that the environment right. is results driven and R&D doesn't necessarily mean there'll be a positive output? So I think maybe the difference between yeah. R&D, and I don't know if this is what you mean by R&D, being separate from BAU. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Look, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do my best. Um, when we say R&D, like we are a product company. So it is the engine of our company. It's about 50% of our investment. And that is working on what we sell. And part of that covers also uh, our, our operations because uh, as much as we can, we are a you built it, you run it type of company. Uh, we've had a variable relationship with that over the years and we're rebuilding that. Um, and so if I was to break it down a little bit around the operational piece, is I guess if you break it down as some buckets around reactive operations, proactive operations, and then investing in your strategy, so moving your roadmap forward, um, we we the way we balance this out is that every team allocates a certain amount of people as our currency uh, towards the reactive and proactive operations. So something caught on fire, put it out. We want to put fire retardant in and make sure it doesn't catch fire again. We have a group of people that rotate through, like each team, there'll be a rotation. Uh, and then a group of people focused on moving the ball forward and then we rotate on some kind of cadence. So that's that's one tease into something that I think is somewhat aligned to the question, I hope. All right, Patrick, if that didn't answer your question, come on back into the Q&A. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're here. Okay, next question is from Wilson. And he says, for a very small platform slash architecture team and for it to facilitate other development teams, how would you quickly scale the platform team? Quickly scale the platform team. Yeah, I understand. So we've um, we've actually, because we had this monolithic team, monolithic architecture, we've only just gone through this process uh, within the last sort of, gosh, where are we at now? Is it... September still, <laughs> nine months. So since January-ish, uh, where we said, we would like to look like this. And we've been in a nine month journey of trying to make it look like that using uh, the, you know, the reverse Conway maneuver. Um, so I can only speak from our experience so far is, um, yeah, clearly identifying which ones are your stream aligned teams. So we're talking team topologies here and which ones are your platform teams that are enabling other teams. Um, with platform teams, we've found that that typically needs a higher level of experience, right? Because it's uh, it's it's higher on the value chain, um, or oh, sorry, lower on the value chain that enables other teams. Um, and so scaling them up quickly, I guess, can be tricky. And so we've found that the people who are working on platform teams have had a higher demand, supply and demand for more experienced engineers. Um, and so that's been a bit of a supply and demand problem about being able to get them on board. How do we scale it up quickly? I guess it's all the things that we talked about before around clearly identifying ownership 
Um, so then you can see clearly that a team is overworked and then they can be more clear about what they're going to pick up and put down. Um, one of the cultural things I didn't talk about before that we didn't write down is we manage scope, not time, right? So high quality um, sort of fixed cadence timelines and iterations, but we manage scope within that. And what that says is a team can only do so much and we don't expect them to do more than that. So it's about adding then uh, throughput firepower and then whether the platform team splits. So again, I hope I've done a good job answering your specific question. And, and I definitely heard you say team topologies. So cheers, everybody. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you might have you might have missed our game earlier on of the spot the team apologies reference. Okay, That's next it. question is from anonymous saying Andy Kelp talked about needing to account for time in R and D. Did you too? Love to hear your solution. Hashtag timesheet hell. Timesheet hell, no. Um, so a part of the concrete reason why I've seen this talked about is around uh, in Australia, R&D tax credits, which is a way of saying you're doing all this cool R&D, which is building blah, 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 really good. We'll give you, um, you know, we'll make you pay less tax. That'd be really nice because we're a really profitable company um, and we pay a lot of tax. So we were thinking, oh, okay, well, that sucks. Let's see if there's ways to not pay tax. So we can hire lots of people to increase our revenues and reduce our profit margins, or we could apply for R&D tax credits. And what's involved in that? Maybe timesheets. And so we've been looking for ways to not have to um, get people to go through the, the rigmarole, the, the pain of doing timesheets in order to you know, allocate what was done towards certain projects for R&D tax credits. So the short story is we haven't done it yet. It is on our radar. We're trying to find a way to do it that is just a byproduct, like a natural byproduct of people doing work and then find a way to correlate that back in an auditable fashion. Gosh, there's so many words going on there, but I hope that helps. <laughs> so short answer, we haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> yeah. On behalf of the people of Australia, thank you, Profitable Tech Company, for paying your taxes. We, yes, that's we it. approve. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> it's a funny odd thing, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is also from Anonymous, which says, is headcount, just as it sounds, the number of people in the team, or is there more to it? Yeah, we actually found that, you know, we were using the term headcount, and some people were dealing, you know, using the word in terms of a budget or a projected number or the actual number. And we found that using the term headcount is like using currency, right? And then we talk about budgets and projections and actuals. And so, um, oh gosh, how quickly, no, I won't scroll through. On the little spreadsheety thing that I showed before, um, we've got, you know, our hiring budget, which we're looking to make annual next year because we found ourselves sort of stopping the pipeline at one point because we're about to overrun our quarterly budget. Uh, so we're looking at an annual budget, which means you can hire this many. Um, and we expect, we predict it's going to take this much time. And then we've got targets that we're aiming for to know how are we tracking? Uh, and then we've got actuals, which is, you know, how many people are in each team at the moment. Um, and so those three terms, you know, Headcount is like currency. This is just my little way of thinking of it. Call me simple. Then you got budget, um, what do I call it? Projected or, um, and then um, actuals. Thank you for not calling us resources as well. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> we wrote that down in our culture. We are people, not resources. Yeah. That's it. And people have heads and you can count them. Okay, <laughs> last question, unless another one pops up, which says, again, from Anonymous, you mentioned performance review. I wonder some of the main parts oh, yeah. of your company's criteria for performance reviewing developers. All right. Okay, lines of code per minute. No, we don't do that. <laughs> uh, we, we were looking for a while, you know, just at a, a measurable things for our teams. And um, we tried two or three times just out of curiosity more than anything, because we were very focused on behavioral, like behavior people driving results. Um, and so that's where we still land. So if you look at our handbook and navigate through to our Octopus People repo and how we do performance reviews, there is, you know, sort of call, clear call outs. Um, and so uh, just trying to make sure I answer the question as well as I can. How do we measure performance of developers? Um, we're generally looking about, here's a definition of what we think good looks like in a certain role because of reasons. So let's call it a senior software engineer. And there's a framing to it. You know, we expect a senior software engineer to be a great coach and mentor for a junior, uh, somebody more their junior. Um, and that they are not working on tasks like task by task. They're able to deconstruct a problem into the steps they've got to take in order to make it to the end and deliver the value. And so we write down what we think good looks like. 
And then we, um, every six months, we do performance uh, reviews. And that's a chance for uh, a, you know, a person to do their self-evaluation and say, you know, what am I, how am I performing against what good looks like? And their manager to do the same uh, or their mentor to help out. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what we do is we've got a framework, an objective framework that people can look at and uh, they go over it every three months and then we do an official performance review every six months.